Adyak. You're listening to Adyak. Adyak is the official podcast of the AAF Greater Lehigh Valley Ad Club. Our mission is to inspire creativity and enhance the professional development of the advertising and marketing communities where we live and work. I'm your host, Bill Childs, and I'll talk with artists, designers, writers, directors, photographers, along with those who work in a creative capacity. Our aim here is to serve as a creative resource to help you stay informed, entertained, and above all, inspired. But first, I want to thank ASR Media. We appreciate your support and collaboration. Welcome to Season 4 of Adyak. Today on the podcast, I get to interview Mr. Lee Abrams. To say that Lee Abrams is a radio legend would be an understatement. His career has spanned over five decades and shows no signs of slowing down. Lee is credited with developing the album rock radio format, first introduced in the 70s to help stations move away from playing hit singles to more album-oriented rock. While he remains passionate about his past, he's focused on reimagining the future. He's consulted over 1,000 radio stations, 12 major print publications, and numerous TV stations and cable networks throughout the country. He's advised bands like Iron Maiden, Yes, The Alan Parsons Project, the Moody Blues, and Bob Seger, among others. Newsweek has listed him as one of their top 100 cultural elites. Industry publication Radio Inc. cited him as one of the 75 most essential radio figures ever. Abrams served as an internal consultant for ABC Radio and helped develop nationwide radio formats such as Z-Rock and Radio Disney. Lee also co-founded XM Satellite Radio. I was fortunate enough to work with Lee when he was named the Chief Innovation Officer at Tribune Publishing, which owned the Morning Call newspaper, and led the effort to inspire change and content innovation at Tribune's print and broadcast divisions. Lee allows the people he works with to expand their comfort zones, and he's not afraid to support calculated risks when required. Like many visionary creative leaders, he can see past the challenges and find the opportunities that often lie hidden in the obstacles. Lee possesses that rare leadership trait that helps inspire those around him with his words and actions. He's a deep thinker, and he understands the importance of a growth mindset. He is humble in his approach and with an unwavering desire to help companies reinvent themselves by assisting them to say goodbye to mediocrity. Lee and I yak it up on many topics, including what inspired him to devote his life to music and radio, his love of flying his own plane, and his desire to never stop working, growing, and evolving. He's the perfect guest to kick off season four. Here is my ad yak with Lee Abrams. Okay, here we are, season four, episode one of ad yak. And my guest is someone that I've been wanting to talk to for a really long time. We got to work a little bit when we were both at Tribune. We're gonna talk about that. Welcome Lee Abrams to the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Appreciate the, uh the opportunity to talk to you. Great to have you, man. We have a lot to get to, but I want to start with the question about what what drew you into this business many years ago or however many years ago? What what was it that captivated you? Well, I would say uh, it was actually remember the date. It was uh, December 10th, 1962. Uh, my parents had got a radio for Christmas from someone. Didn't want it, gave it to me. And at that time, I was always kind of fascinated by radio but not a fanatic and I turned it on and dialed around and the loudest station I could get was WLS which was the big rock station at the time and I just fell in love with it it was amazing the uh, of course the music itself but the magic between the songs sort of the, uh, hmm. the jingle and the uh, the production and of course the disc jockeys and it all came together as kind of this uh, amazing audio orchestra and uh, from that moment on i was absolutely hooked and uh, you know later got a better radio so i could pick up distant stations and uh, it was all over it was, but it really took that first real listen on that radio and i thought oh, this is amazing it's, what yeah. have i been missing and uh, never looked back wow a buddy of mine uh was actually on the air in uh, I didn't know him then, obviously, but it, it was a long time ago. 1974, Dayton, Ohio. He was on a radio station, uh, WVUD, out of, um, I guess it was the college station there. Uh, in it Dayton. was the college station, yep. 
And boy, does he tell stories about those days with just like, like it kind of blows my mind how like they wouldn't put bad commercials on the air. Like if it was a bad, com- they, they refused to put bad commercial, like you, they, they, and even as a college station, there was a level that they were going for. And if you weren't going to play in on, at that level, you weren't going to put on a commercial where you're just going to scream at the listeners and have people tune out. Yeah. Uh, there was, um, that kind of uh, focus on integrity back then that you certainly don't see now. And part of that integrity was, uh, you know, limiting the style of commercials they would air. I remember that was common. A lot of uh, stations actually turned down early on the uh, army commercials and things like that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because of their whole peace love orientation. Right. But, uh, you know, when it became a business, that all changed. Well, I think too, like he used to talk about, and I think he, I think I even heard you use this phrase, theater of the mind. Radio is theater of the mind. Yes, there's a radio experience uh, that really can't be duplicated anywhere else on any other platform. And that is, um, you know, the magic of the, of the songs and the production and just the overall vibe of it, uh, that vibe of companionship. It's kind of unfortunately a lost art now, but uh, certainly back then it was uh, it was magical when done right. Speaking of a lost art, you know, one of the things that's coming back is vinyl in a big way. Yeah. I'm buying all my uh, old albums again. I'm, I'm like, it's like yeah. a full circle. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I bought one of those, um, one of those uh, stereo consoles from like, like the, it was a Sears Silvertone that I bought. Top of the line. I just, my buddy refurbishes them and I just <laughs> bought one the sound that comes out of those things. I mean, it has radio, obviously it has, it, it has a, a, a turntable and he hooked it up to Bluetooth. So I could play my songs through, from my iPod through it, but boy, do I love playing albums on that, man. Talk about it. Oh an- yeah. I like just the physical feel of an album, you, can, you know, read the liner notes and uh, yeah. I mean, this is experience your comeback. Although I noticed a lot of people buy them as collector's items. Don't actually play them, but they buy them for the, the mm. experience of holding it and reading it. But uh, definitely a resurgence going on. Yeah, I mean, it's been for a while, but now there's this store that I go to, Siren Records, uh, outside in Doylestown, uh, Pennsylvania. And, man, they got everything. I'm just like in there. I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I just yeah. want to take them uh, yeah. But I'll tell you, they're, they're, they must be doing something with the pressings. I don't know if you know, it, the albums, are they're so heavy now, like heavy to, to carry. Like It must be a different gauge of vinyl, yeah. Yeah, must, yeah, maybe because they're, they're, I mean, an album now, a new one, it, it's like 25, 26 bucks. Yeah, right. On the low end. Yeah. So um, I know that you and I uh, chewed some of the same dirt when we worked for Tribune. And I wanted to share with you a story and then get your comment on it. Um, you were responsible for, as the chief innovation officer for Tribune, you were responsible for a lot of the redesigns of the papers. Right. So I gotta tell you. Man, that was exciting to be a part of. I mean, to to watch, you know, basically what you did from my perspective is you came into a market and you basically freed the creatives and the people that had ideas, you gave them a voice. You said, I want to see your ideas. I want to see the ideas that that you you put out that got rejected and you had you have at the bottom of your 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 desk for years. I want to see them. I want to, I want to bring them out. I bet there's some really good stuff. And that that was a real exciting motivating intoxicating time to be a part of that and watch you you know spearhead that but also funny how you made a lot of the leadership very nervous you know you I bet. i'm sure you were aware of as you were doing but i i was in those meetings with you and i'm just like keep going keep it coming bring it on like i'm like yep yep this is what we need and the 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 powers that be were just they just weren't having it. They just wanted status quo. How do you how, how did you feel about that time when you were doing that? I mean, I know you 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 brought some of the the Orlando Sentinel was doing some great stuff in the Baltimore Sun, the L.A. Times. Can you talk about that time and just your your role in it and and how that all kind of felt for you to kind of be a part of? Yeah, you know, it was the uh, the mandate was to. Uh, Help evolve newspapers. It was obviously on a downward spiral. And a lot of it was economics, but a lot of it was uh, the look, feel, and smell of a newspaper hadn't been 
rethought in, in decades. And uh, here we were at an amazing crossroads with the internet coming in yep. and uh, you know, so many other news sources emerging. Uh, it needed a shakeup creatively. And when I first got there, I realized quickly that the journalists were running everything. Uh, and that's fine. They're there to, uh, to you know, gather news and, and break stories. But presentationally, they didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. You know, they just they didn't want anything upsetting the, uh, the Apple cart. When I first got there, I remember there was a guy at the Chicago Tribune, very creative guy, came to my office and said, hey, look what I, I designed for the future of the Tribune. I said, wow, this is very cool. Uh, what happened? Would you present it? Oh God, I'd never present. I get fired if I presented this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that sort of said, "Oh, okay, I get it." And uh, you know, they changed the font on the uh, fourth page of the financial section and think, you know, the world is going to end. And they took themselves way too seriously. <laughs> I remember one meeting. Um, you know, somebody said, nobody does investigative journalism better than we do. I said, yeah, you do a great job. I mean, there's 60 minutes. 60 minutes? That's garbage. That's television. That's not journalism. You know, that whole attitude permeated the place. And um, I realized, you know, there are these creative people there, like yourself, who were tons of ideas and motivated to, uh, to move forward. And... Um, they were, you know, shoved in a closet until I, hopefully until I got there and liberated them. But there, there, were, some, some, there were some papers that did embrace what you were trying to, to, to do. Oh, yeah, I know. Certainly the Orlando Sentinel, you guys did, the Baltimore did, a lot of them. Uh, but there was still that, um, you know, this is a holy temple of journalistic excellence. How dare you come in here and try to, you know, change anything. And uh, that was tough to, uh, to deal with. And sure. again, coming from radio, uh, at least then, it's changed now. But back then, it was always about, uh, you know, a media war. We're out there to get ratings. We're out there to win, whatever it takes. Con continue to evolve. Continue to update. And newspapers just uh, were very happy with uh, where they were going. And the story selection, too, was weird. I also remember in Chicago, uh, I think it was... Jimmy Buffett coming and selling a uh, soldier field, which is, you know, thousands and thousands. And there was a little sentence about it. And then there were three pages about one of the people from the opera company leaving. Mm. <laughs> I got like three massive coverage. Mm -hmm. So they had things really, um, you know, again, self-important and we know what people want and they didn't. And uh, those are all things we tried to try to change uh, to a certain level of success, depending on on where some markets you know, didn't want to hear it. We are the so and so. I remember one particular meeting you were in. Um, it was the whole leadership team. I was there as the because I was the creative director, and um, you and I started having a conversation. And my boss, the VP of marketing, after the meeting, pulls me over and he goes, "What, what was that?" I go, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Well, you guys were talking." You and you were talking to Lee. It sounded like an, a foreign language, but he understood what you were saying. You understood what he was saying, and you had this whole conversation. <laughs> we had this whole exchange, apparently, that he didn't understand what we were saying, but you and I did. He's and he wasn't mad at me. He was like, "That was really cool." I just didn't know what the hell you were saying. <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, it was a whole new mindset we brought into the company." And uh, a lot of them were, you know, newspaper lifers who, again, didn't get it. I would say. Looking back, I think 80% of the people at Tribune uh, really wanted to evolve. Mm -hmm. Then there were, uh, you know, a large percentage of what are these guys talking about? And then there was a percentage, a very vocal percentage of, you know, how dare them enter this, you know, again, temple of journalistic excellence and, and try to change us. They don't know what they're talking about. So it was, uh, it was a difficult uh, situation, but I think we did some good things. Absolutely. Yeah, it was fun to be a part of. I remember um, uh, one of the uh, one of the kind of the mantras uh, you kind of developed, if you remember AFDI. Yes, <laughs> actually fucking doing it. That's where, uh, <laughs> you know, well, that originally started when I was consulting radio stations. And I remember going into a market. They uh, the station used to have like seven and eight chairs. Now they're down to a three. 
And, uh, you know, I talked to the general manager about it. And uh, he was very, threw up his arms. What are we going to do? I said, well, let's get you, the program director, the chief engineer, the sales manager, everybody in a hotel room and lock the doors with five or six radios. Let's listen to everybody hmm. and just tear them apart, including ourselves. Great idea. So we go to this hotel, check into a suite, a bunch of us, and literally for 12 hours, just go through ideas and what we're doing wrong and what they're doing wrong, how to capitalize on it. And uh, I said, great. And then I'd leave town, be the consultant, and I'd come back a month later, and all excited, you know, oh, how did we do? Uh, well, we decided to hold off on that idea. Okay, how about this one? Well, I don't think home office would go for that. How about mm -hmm. this one? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. How about this one? Well, we thought we'd research it first. Bottom line is they did nothing. And um, that's where the term AFDI comes in. If you talk about it, do it. And as a result of doing nothing, that station went down again. And you know, they could have turned it around because we had the ideas to do it, but they didn't have the, the courage to, uh, to execute. You know, and uh, that yeah. can tribute a lot. You know, uh, we are the, the leader. We are the greatest. We are this. It's big talk, show it, you know, it's, uh, and uh, some of them did, some of them just refused or did yeah, I, it. was, it was, you know, I was at the, I was at the morning call for 17 years. So I saw, I got to experience all of that, you know, pre-internet, you know, I started in 89, went 10 years, then I left for eight years and then it came back. You know, we didn't get the first Macintosh computers in, in the art department until 96, um, but I saw, I saw a little, I saw an arrogance, um, in the leadership that just like, to your point, that just was like, no, we're the morning call. We've been here for 135 years. We're not going anywhere. We're, we're the, we're kind of the only game in town. Right. And they, they leaned into that and that, that, that was dangerous. It happened to Bethlehem steel, uh, you know, Bethlehem steel, uh, who's going to top, top Bethlehem steel. Well, it happened. And that's an yeah. There are a lot of companies like that, ego. particularly traditional ones, who uh, just you know don't don't evolve when it's ne when it's necessary. It's always and... necessary. That's the point. You always have yeah. to be evolving. And you know, it this isn't just in newspapers and radio and media either. This is in almost every business that that exists on the planet. You have these people that are just like they're they're unwilling to listen to a new way of doing things, and they just can't yep. wrap their head around it. I know, locked into a certain way of doing it, and uh, despite the uh, all the indications, they won't do anything about it. You see some of these companies too, with um, with these really old, out of date logos, and they just, you know, some grandfather sketched it on a napkin, so that means they can't ever change it. I I don't agree with that that at all. I think like no. you have to evolve and grow continually. I know that that's that's it's a lot of work, but that's what's required. It really, really is, you know, as long as it, it just, I just never understood it. I, I, I still see it. Um, I still see it today. A lot of businesses oh, it's, unwilling it's to kind of look at themselves in a hard light. Right. Really uh, do an inventory of their product or culture and uh, discover the flaws and change it, fix it. And just even it's, a lot of companies are, they are not even willing to talk about it. They don't even want to talk about those things, which how oh, is that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I saw a quote that you gave uh, Variety Magazine in September of 2020, um, talking about radio now. You said, today, radio has become too corporate, too consolidated, too boring. Um, still feel that way? Oh, it's worse than ever. I think uh, radio shot itself in the foot. Uh, again, the uh, competition from streaming, from satellites is everywhere. And you'd think they'd be on creative steroids trying to, you know, move it forward and get in the game. And they're not. They're sitting back and letting it die. Mm. Uh, and the cliches and the excuses. Uh, well, it'll get better when the economy improves. No, it won't. Or, uh, you know, you know we're, we're uh, just having a slump. No, you're not. Or, we're, oh, the, my favorite is, well, uh, those other satellites and all that, they're not local. Realistically, you're not either, you could tell them, mm -hmm. because uh, the transmitter might be in City X, but they're taking voice tracks from another market and they're mm -hmm. semi automated. And, you know, if something uh, newsworthy breaks locally, 
chances are there's uh, maybe, except for maybe one or two news stations in the market, um, you know, there's nobody there to deal with it because uh, they're, again, they're running voice tracks. So radio is shooting off in the foot. It used to be run by broadcasters. Now it's run by uh, bankers. Mm. And uh, their eye is completely off the creative ball. When a new station goes on nowadays, it's, uh, well, let's get a morning show and throw up some billboards. You know, that's it. In right. reality, evolving or changing your uh, radio station is like Schwarzkopf in the Gulf War. I mean, it's a major mission. you got to really dig in. Mm -hmm. You've got to reset the culture. You've got to really change so it's noticeable. That's another problem with newspapers and radio. When they change, it's not noticeable. Um, right, right, I agree. Yep. Yeah, one newspaper, again, uh, I think they moved the uh, the banner of sports, you know, over a few inches. Well, we fixed it. We've evolved. Nobody's going to notice that. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And uh, TV news is also horrible at that. You know, the weatherman now stands up and gives the weather instead of sitting down. Oh, that's going to change anything. It's like, what are they thinking? Cliches. Noticeability, cliches. It's uh, all a disease. And uh, people running these stations, again, they're just trying to stay in business. Uh, yeah, I, I think totally they're doing it way. And, um, but see, I know, argue you can have both. I think oh, yeah, both. And radio today is innovating, but they're innovating on the operation side, which usually means cutting back mm. or finding new entities. And that, that's a, the net result is that the listeners suffer. And uh, radio has a lot of users, but it doesn't have any fans. It doesn't have many fans. I remember not that long ago, you drive down the street and every other car would have a radio station bumper sticker. One of the last time you saw a radio station bumper sticker. Uh, it just doesn't have fans. Uh, it's like it's as it's as sexy as the utility company. You know, it gets used, but you're not a fan of it. Well, and, I think your point, one of the first points you made was, where's the experience? The experience is missing, right? Yes, that, that, absolutely. Yeah. That rate, classic radio experience is gone. When we started XM, we used to play air checks, tapes of great radio stations from as far back as the fifties and sixties. And the idea wasn't copy this, but it was just capture that attitude and rethink it for the 21st century. Uh, but recapture that magic on today's terms. And a lot of the channels, most of them did. And it was, uh, you know, it was very successful. Well, let's talk about that. You were one of the co-founders of XM Radio. Talk yeah, I was actually the first that, that, The idea behind la launching that. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I was, uh, there was actually Gary Parsons who uh, was got the license and a guy named Lon Levin. And uh, I was, again, the first hire. And it was an incredible experience because we got to handpick every employee, wow. every staff member. And on the programming side, it was a couple hundred. And of every hundred we talked to, interviewed, 99 didn't get it. That one person that did said, "Yeah, we can we can change this. We can evolve radio," and uh, we had actually two years to build it. So we hired the people, we put them through boot camps, which were these half day sessions to really cleanse themselves of everything they learned about radio and relearn the XM way. And it sounds very you know, boot camp. It's, it sounds you know horrible. No, it was a liberating experience for these people. It, uh, it gave them new ideas, new freedoms, and it allowed people to do radio for the reason they got into it in the first place, which was, you know, creative and entertaining. But it found themselves in a position where they were cutting promos for wet t-shirt contests and, uh, you know, just part of this real uptight environment. So, um, again, these boot camps helped create the culture. And we had great people. And then we had a lot of time to experiment and try things. And we finally launched, although we were launching on uh, September 11, 2001. Hmm. That didn't go well. Uh, so we uh, obviously changed it to November. But in those two years, it was just an incredibly magical time, fueled by creativity, really no rules. We built a cliche buzzer. If anybody comes up with a radio cliche, they get buzzed. Three buzzes and you're fired. Nobody got fired. But uh, you know, somebody would say, let's do a 
two for Tuesdays, or that's been done by 50,000 radio stations. Right. Let's have a funny morning guy with a, a news chick sidekick. It's been done and very well. So um, we were able to decliché people a lot, and that really got them thinking of new and different ways. It was a really exciting time, and we had a great team, and uh, everybody was just charged up. And, and uh, again, it was uh, we were manufacturing magic 24-7. Yeah. I got to experience something similar to that in my career. Um, sadly, only two years out of the 40 that I've been in this career, two years um, where it, where now I got a little bit of it when you were at Tribune, but you know, you were hitting a lot of roadblocks. You hit a lot of walls. So we were kind of like, you know, it, it wasn't like um, we didn't have carte blanche to, to, to do all that we would have hoped to do. But the, the two years that I spent at a, a billboard company, Adams Outdoor Advertising in the um, late nineties for two years, we had a GM that decided he was done selling signs on the side of the road. He was in the field for like 27 years and he put creativity on a pedestal and he listed about 10 things that were going to happen if we did this. And number, number 10 was we're going to increase revenue, but there were nine that were above that, that were all just about the market's going to look better. The, the, the clients that are doing outdoor are going to get better results businesses that had never done outdoor are going to want to get in on the game. The bill posters are going to enjoy posting the, the, the designs more because they're better looking. We were going to, we were, we held the clients accountable to, we weren't going to let you, we weren't, you're not putting a phone number and a website and a burst and all kinds of other crap that you would normally see in a newspaper ad. We're not letting you put that on a billboard anymore. In other words, and, and ready for this one, he gave final approval Lee to the designers, the two artists of which I was one, of what went on the road. They had to go through us. Unheard of. Oh, that's cool. Unheard of. And we didn't get drunk with that power and be like, we're going to reject everything. Because we knew we were still running a business. But it it increased the level of the market and how it looked. And we, we, we won Obi Awards and we won Addy Awards and the clients were happier and the markets looked better. Two years. Two years. That's the only, that's the only time I got to experience what you're talking about, manufacturing magic. All cylinders were firing because that GM said, I'm putting creativity and design on a pedestal and we're all going to worship it. And he did a thing too, where he said to me, he said, Bill, I want you running creative sessions. And I said, okay, what happens in those? I didn't know at the time. I was coming out of the newspaper, right? We didn't have creative sessions. He said, I want you to be able to, to give the reps intelligent advice and give them the opportunity and the ability to speak intelligently about good design. I'm like, I could do that. And he said, I want them every week for an hour. No reps are going to be able to get out of it by saying they have an appointment or they got a big sale or they got a, no rep could, they, he made it mandatory. And that's what I did. And those reps then after, after a year and a half or a year or whatever, whatever it took to, to start to sink in, they could go in front of a client and speak intelligently about hierarchy, font choice, you know, design and it it just worked. It was unbelievably. I did That's I, great. I interviewed I interviewed him, John Hayes, um, on my podcast for the last season, and we talked about all of that. Um what a great John Hayes guy. from Canada? No, mm -mm. uh they're from uh Midwest. They have like 14 oh. markets, Midwest, Northeast. Yeah, Adams Outdoor. So and and by the way, fun fact, um, outdoor is the one traditional media. That's still growing year over year. I believe it. I believe it. Well, it's great. It's so important having a leader that, uh, that gets that. We had a station. Uh, we signed a station in Chicago, a great station, The Loop, WLUP, back in 79. And I remember the owner, a guy named Cecil Heftel, who was a congressman from Hawaii, uh, pointed to the Cadillacs in the parking lot. And said, those are salesmen cars, right? I said, yeah, probably. Well, when I'm done, all your programming people are going to be driving those Cadillacs. <laughs> okay, well, that's the right attitude. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so there used to be real broadcasters involved in radio, and now few and far between. I think you can do that manufacturing magic, like you said. I think you can do that in any business, anywhere. With oh, the, absolutely. With the right people. Yep. 
no we, gotta, doubt. we gotta have people there that are like like look we're not gonna you know we're we're gonna reinvent we're gonna talk about it we're gonna we're gonna explore we're gonna go into the forest and you know and look for some stuff that we didn't you know what i mean you, you have to get in that <laughs> totally yeah. how do you get people to get into that mindset is it possible can you do it or does it have to be somebody that already wants to go there do you know what i'm trying to say yeah i think it's mostly people that want to go there but also uh there's somewhere on the ledge you can see have uh, or on the you know on the fence yeah. who uh you can see they have potential and they want to do it they just need to be liberated and that's where those uh uh boot camps really helped where we gathered a team and just talked about you know the whole mindset the whole culture we're trying to create and uh a lot of the most of those people who were like on the fence came around and really got their game on. Uh, but I think it does take a certain type of person. Uh, some are very, um, you know, numbers people, numbers crunchers, yeah. and just don't get it, which is fine because you need those too. Sure. Um, but anybody in the creative area, I think, uh, who's already there has a potential to be liberated because uh, if they're in the creative area in the first place, they obviously have a passion for it, but it's that liberation, that ability to open and free their mind. That's important because so many of them are conditioned to what has been done. Uh, well, it's always worked that way. Well, what if you try it this way? Well, I guess I try it that way. That's great. And then they continue to like the experiment. don't want to risk. Nobody wants to risk anything. Oh, I know. I know. You risk nothing. You risk everything. But it takes that leadership to uh, instill that, that it's okay to make mistakes. We had a thing called a creative batting average, where if somebody comes up with 100 ideas and 70 of them stink, yep. great. You're an all-star. You're batting 300. Uh, the problem is people batting zero, zero, zero. They're in the dugout, have an idea, walk up the hallway, they go, nah, walk back into the dugout. Never taking that creative swing because it's okay to strike out as long as you have those hits in there because nobody will remember the strikeouts they'll remember the hits yeah. so we look for 300 hitters um again meaning 30 percent of their crazy ideas are really good and uh you know just taking that creative at bat is where it, where it starts well, it's so funny one of the things that john said to me too i said well john i said what happens in a creative session this was the gm at adams i said what happens in them and he said, that's for you to figure out. Now think about that. He gave me the trust. He told me he trusts me. He said, and then the only thing he told me was, I just want at the end of the day, I want these sessions to be you giving your knowledge. I'm not, I don't want you to teach them how to do Photoshop and Illustrator. I just want them to be able to speak intelligently about design. That's it. It's beautiful. You know, at some companies, what would have happened is I would have been given a binder about everything that I should talk about you know, the importance of filling out your paperwork on time, the importance of filling out, you know, your, you know, your account, uh, keeping up your account calendar and, you know, all that kind of stuff that just bogs everybody down. But yeah, it's beautiful that he just said, that's for you to figure out. And, and I, I did poetry readings. I did, um, I did all kinds of crazy stuff in that, in that meeting and it, and it worked, it worked. It, it really did work, but you have to have that charismatic leader at the top that gives you that permission that opens the gate and says, Absolutely. Oh, Right. culture now how do you as someone that have, has done that for you know on a multitude of levels how do you how do you handle rejection what what what's your what's your coping mechanism for for handling something? Uh, you know, really, you know uh, failed something and it's so right and it and it and they just can't commit how do you how do you cope with that it's persistence uh just keeping at it i think uh you know running into that a bit uh, we have a uh really dramatic new 24 seven news concept for digital. And it's uh, hard finding a buyer. Uh, traditional broadcast groups generally, you know, are a bit arrogant, you know, uh, not unlike newspapers. And, uh, and, you know, there are investors and others who are really interested You just gotta keep pushing and it'll happen. Um, yeah. If you believe in something, don't let it go. Just keep pushing. You may find the right uh, the right situation uh, sooner than later. Uh, a lot of people give up. 
I know like the guy who started Pandora, I think went through like 200 VCs before he got any money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, uh, it's not doing so well now, but in its glory days, it was, uh, you know, pretty revolutionary. But uh, um, persistence is it. Uh, again, there might be a time when you realize that, well, this idea really isn't worth it on to other things. But if it's something you really believe in, boy, just, just don't give up. Okay. All right. So talk to me a little bit about Media Visions. Well, that's just an LLC that I put all my projects under, and it's currently uh, focused on three main projects. And um, Media Visions is just a, a company, an LLC that everything goes through, the business all nature. All right. You know, I have to... Um... I have to ask you about this. I, I don't know if you'll remember it. I certainly do because it was, um, I think about it a lot after the fact. And just to the point of what we were talking about, you know, I have to look at myself and realize that there was a time when I was afraid to take a risk. Um, when you asked me to come work with you at the Tribune Tower, I should, right. have, I should have done it. I, yeah, should have well. <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I never forgot that because I thought well, that, could been, that could have been a, uh, Ooh, that could have been fun. The two of us working together. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. It could have been great, but you blew it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did blow it. That's fair. That's fair. Now, did you have people in other markets that, um, that you enjoyed working with that you knew, like, you know, got it, like, you know, people in Orlando or Baltimore or like that just, you felt like yeah, we could work uh, with these people, we could do something if we. Are yourself, there, there, there were two particular ones. Uh, John Ziegler at WPIX, who's right. now chief marketing officer of Sinclair. He really got it. Okay. Uh, and he was more on the TV. So it didn't have, they didn't have a newspaper at that time, but he was, uh, he really, he really got it. He just, uh, uh, the kind of guy who, uh, was so ready to be liberated mm. and didn't take any time for him to come up with legal pads full of ideas and, and sketches. And that was great. But Anita Burton down in, uh, Orlando was great too. She was the uh, creative person there and uh, also really understood. I mean, it was really frustrated too by the, uh, you know, the, the stiffness of her management. Yeah. But she really, she really totally got it. Those two really come to mind. There were others, but uh, okay. those were creative superstars. I also remember a time when I presented a, a marketing campaign to you. Um, it was the life read all about it. And it was um, us focusing on how the paper affects readers, like people that have had their lives changed because of a story that was written in the morning call. And you loved it. I remember Tim Ryan was in the room. I remember that. Yeah. And you were like, this is what I'm talking about. There's no marketing speak on this. It's just authentic. It's genuine. It's real. And you gushed about it. And Tim Ryan said that he would do it in Baltimore, which they did ultimately. But I remember thinking, um, boy, if Tribune embraced this as a whole company wide, that could have been a really, really nice marketing campaign, like Tribune wide, you know, LA could have done it, you know, uh, Baltimore, well, Baltimore did do it. Orlando could have done it. You know, some of the other papers could have done it. And it was, uh, it was one of those things, Lee, that it was so simple. You f I mean, hard to find the people, but once you found the people, the campaign kind of created itself. You take a picture, you put a headline on them, you interview them. We cut the TV together. You could have cut it together with iMovie. It was that simple. And it worked. Life. Read all about it. And yeah, you, that was a good idea. Movie. Yeah, a lot of the uh, news publishers, you know, uh, don't like the idea of sharing or doing something. It's, it was weird. Hmm. I mean, there was a time when... Um, I forgot which war it was, probably Afghanistan. But uh, I think the Tribune as a company was sending like 20 people over, a couple from Chicago, a couple from LA. I said, wait, why don't we just hire the best person? Sure. Oh, no, no, no. Our LA Times take on it is different. And Chicago, no, no, no. We have our people. They eventually succumbed to just the financial reality of not, not sending so many people when it could just send one or two. Right. But uh, 
yeah, that was a common situation with publishers and and uh, management of the various papers. Now, here's what I want to know. I want to know when your book's coming out. I hope next year. I got to. Uh, I need to find. I got it written, but I need to find a professional writer to really write it. Mm. I'm hoping next year. An editor. You need an Certainly editor. Enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, I think I saw the title on your. You have a working title. It's pretty good. Oh yeah, uh, solutions for a creatively starved planet. Yeah. We'll love that. That's awesome. Yeah, and it really talks about uh, all the opportunities on the creative side uh, with you know, practical experiences in radio and newspapers and television and print. And uh, yeah, I think it'll, uh, I think it'll be good. Well, I just liked used to like reading your blogs and well, now I can go on to, you know, your page on media visions and I can read them. I recently read one about, um, you know, not retiring and that resonated with me because I, I, I don't want to ever stop doing this in, in any capacity. Oh. I mean, you know, why would you, right? All those years of wisdom and everything that you've gathered and the, the knowledge that you have that you can share. I mean, that's why I'm teaching now. I'm teaching, um, I left uh, I left the field and I teach uh, advertising design. Um, it's more of a design. Oh, really? There's so much advertising. Oh, yeah, I'm teaching the next generation. And one of the things that oh, I start with fantastic. is what do I tell them? What do I tell them when they run into people that just don't get it? Well, you just got to, uh, they have to be selective. Uh, there's some people who just won't and uh, just focus on the ones that may or do. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, well, the reason I got to Tribune is um, Randy Michaels, who I'd known, you know, it's all about it. Let's, let's change this. Let's fix it. Let's evolve. And so he got it. Mm -hmm. The previous uh, CEO of Tribune would have probably thrown my letter in the, in the garbage. Right. Because they were about tradition. So it depends. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know that you were also involved heavily in a lot of uh, band management of, of bands and musicians and artists. Um, Bob Seeger, right? Iron Maiden. Yeah, I, was, I did these big reports for um, the state of the American, their American audience. And I was really closest with the uh, Moody Blues and Yes. They, they okay. were really uh, work closely with and uh, still keep friendship. And that was, uh, was a little tricky because I was consulting all these radio stations. So I had to go with artists that were established. And I would think it was Paola. It right, wasn't right. This information that I gathered from the streets. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, talk about politics and craziness. You know, bands are, <laughs> it can be just as bad as corporate America. Really? But, uh, oh, yeah. You know, it's, there's a spinal tap factor in a lot of bands. <laughs> <laughs> also, but, didn't, you, uh, didn't you do stuff with Alan Parsons? Yes, a lot. Um, I actually did vocals on one of the albums, one of the songs. That's awesome. But uh, worked with him for years and uh, continue to, working on a major project with Alan now. That's awesome. That'll be out next year. So, yeah, Alan and I go way back. Still talk to any of the guys in Maiden? No, not really. I haven't talked to them lately. That was a fun project, too. You see, Bruce uh, Dickinson flies his own 747. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's a pilot, too. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's just another thing that I, I that caught my attention. Um, my nephew just started flying, and um, I think he's flying... He's out. He's he's in an airport or a, somewhere outside, working for a company outside of Nashville, like two hours outside of Nashville. He he, he does two flights a day, uh, but he's trying to get his hours up, you know, so he can, you know, what is it? I guess he has to get like 150 hours or something, and then he can apply to like other you know, like commercial airlines. You have nine thousand hours. I saw. Yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> a lot of time now. Flying. A lot of a lot of flights to Allentown. Yeah. I know you talked about picking me up one day and going into New York and going album hunting. <laughs> Should have done it too. I was like, let's do it. Um, do you, what do you like about flying? I mean, wh how'd you get into that? I mean, that's uh... Oh, um, I had always been into airplanes and radio uh, or music, music, radio, media. Um, and as soon as I could get a license, I did back in uh, I guess it was 67 or 68. And always considered, uh, you know, being a pilot, but I realized if I'm a pilot, I can't do media. 
on media, I can always have a plane. Mm. So that, that that's really set the career direction. But I was always, ever since, uh, God, even before I was in the radio, as far back as I can remember, I was fascinated by airplanes. Well, I would imagine it would help with your flying around to all these stations, right? You're, you're not having to get on commercial flights. You just fly yourself there. Yeah, yeah I did a lot of that. Uh, though when I was in radio, I would hit five markets a week, and sometimes commercial was just easier because of the fatigue <laughs> involved. Yeah, that's, right. that's a tremendous 9,000 hours. I mean, that's a lot of hours. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it goes back quite a ways, and uh, there were years there. Well, as a Tribune, I was flying everywhere uh, yeah. uh, in my plane. And uh, it adds up, and it helps keep you uh, current and uh, proficient if you fly yeah, a lot. Sure. I know people who get their license and don't fly much, and that's a little. That can be a little dangerous. You got to really keep it up and go for additional ratings, commercial and instrument, and uh, yep, all that. Yep. Yeah. So let me ask you this: What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Well, that's a good question. Um, Really just believe in your ideas uh, and and be an evangelist for them. Because uh, if you don't believe them, nobody else will. So uh, really have ideas. If you have them and they're really good and you really thought about it, just go for it. Don't let anything get in the way. And be prepared for roadblocks. You know, be prepared for people not getting it, whatever. That's common. If it's really a good new idea, most people won't get it until they see it or hear it or read it. Or until it succeeds, then they all want it. Oh, yeah. Then when it <laughs> succeeds, they go from being an idiot to being a genius. So uh... <laughs> and There is a microscopically thin line between being a genius and sounding like an idiot. Oh, yeah. And with social media today, you know, you got to have thick skin because you do something different and everybody will. What are you doing? That, that'll never work. And uh, I remember XM, we were just besieged with uh, mainly people from terrestrial radio. You know, that's a joke. It'll never, uh, it'll never work. Nobody will pay for radio. And uh, it for works. Radio, they will. Yeah, really. So what's a piece of advice you could give somebody today that maybe start now? What do you, you know, what do you, what would you tell them? Maybe start out in media. Uh, I would say, um, well, there are a couple of paths want to go to if you want to be a disruptor an innovator and really use your creative chops again just what i learned select the idea and just go for it and uh have thick skin and be ready to hear a lot of disappointing news and rejections but if you really believe it's good just go for it and uh and media is interesting in you know technology aerospace medicine it's fueled by innovation Media should be, but it's not. It's uh, media needs to be in the same business as aerospace, medicine, technology, and other forward-thinking areas because it has such reach. And uh, again, there's potential to have fans and not just users. And most media has users. I mean, they're fans. There's Fox has fans and and, and the like. But uh, most companies, most media products don't. They just have users. And that's where it comes to creative people to invent new ways of doing things and believe in it and stick with it. Because eventually you'll find somebody who gets it and then you'll probably succeed with it. And then again, you'll be, you'll be the genius instead of the pest or the, or the idiot for coming up with this. Yeah. I mean, I, even though it was only two years where I had, uh, where everything was firing, you know, creativity was shoved to the, put on a pedestal. I am glad that I got to experience it, even if it was only for two years, because I knew I, I and then what I tried to do is with my team at the morning call where you where we met, I was trying to bring that forward with how I led my team, you know, giving them that experience that I got at Adam, I, you know, and I, and I for most part, I was able to do that. And I got to work with some really great people, really great designers. Um, I've been fortunate in that respect and that I, I have worked with a real a lot of really great, talented people. You know, so that, that's, that's been fun. I've, I've had I've had a good career and I'm I'm still having a good career. I'm, um, you know, getting to do this podcast for the AAF, talk to people like you and, you know, bring bring the, the message of like creativity and design and innovation. And 
and that mindset to, you know, to people out there that that need to hear it, that it's, you know, that there's more people out there like like us than what we realize, you know? Oh, absolutely. Okay. They just need to be liberated, discovered and liberated. I like that. They need to be liberated. I love this other line you used to say, information is the new rock and roll. It's yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it is. Uh, I mean, rock and roll, you know, it's popular, but it looks backwards. If you look at the top rock bands uh, in concert, it's, you know, it's the Eagles and Pink Floyd and, and Paul McCartney. But uh, as far as what's happening right now, it's really not rock and roll. It's information. Instead of people with their uh, Walkman listening to tunes, they got their phone reading information, finding information. So I think it's what's driving the culture. We're in an information society. And uh, people are addicted to it. And that's another area of news, which I think has incredible opportunity because uh, TV news particularly hasn't been updated in 50 or 60 years. Mm. And other than new lipstick and a new logo and a slogan, but it hasn't really been, been evolved. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Right. Well, Lee, I got to tell you, this was, this was great getting to talk to you you know oh. listening to you i i would where would people if they want to go find out more information about you what's your what's the website that you would send them to well to keep it simple lee abrams dot rocks r-o-c-k-s that'll send you right to media vision that's perfect uh, yeah um, i'd encourage people so you got a you got a lot of stu uh, cool stuff happening i mean you're still doing it you're not going to stop doing it and i love it oh no, no it's it's uh, it's in my DNA, you know, it's, uh, it's important to keep progressing. There was another quote that I would hear. It's not a quote. It's more of a saying, um, uh, your vibe attracts your tribe. Yeah. It's, uh, you gotta walk the walk. <laughs> so I, I think it's safe to say we're in each other's tribe. Yep. I I'm amazed at so many, uh, well, it's mainly in TV, but you read their mission statements in the lobby. I remember one station, you know, we are the leaders in public service. We uh, break investigative stories. We are on the cutting edge of innovation and all these things. I remember asking the um, sales manager of the station, do you believe that? He said, hell no. If we did half of those things, we'd be number one in the market. So there's a lot of big, that gets back to AFDI. There's a lot of big talk, and bold yeah. mission statements, but very few execute. They, they talk big and, uh, and TV news is really funny because they'll uh, we have a new set with uh, new counters. New, and again, who cares? You know, it's uh, right. You got new. And they think that's going to you know make the ratings go through the roof. It's hilarious. Where are they getting their advice from? On each that? other. Focus groups. Yeah, focus groups or more likely just each other. You know? Pat each other on the back, how great they are, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, meanwhile they're suffering. Yeah, I think it's just a, I think it's a, a lack of vision and you got to have the, you got to have the mindset that you never, you never can arrive. You, you, you never arrive. You always right. have to be searching. You got to be on a constant quest for, you know, the, like not that, not that you're, you're never going to be satisfied, but you, you can't just do something and then just assume that it's all going to take care of itself. You, you have to kind of have the humility to, to look at yourself. If you're leading the team, like, am I leading this team properly? You know, um, what can I, what more do they need from me? And, and you just don't see that in a lot of leadership. It's more of like, you know, what, what can the, uh, the, the employees do for me, the leader, as opposed to going the other way down, you know? Yeah. Or they'll just follow the, uh, safe route and just hope to keep their gig by playing it safe yeah and, uh, need people to stand out and uh and reimagine things yeah well lee i want to thank you for this time i know you're a busy guy i appreciate this so much spending time talking to me here on ad yak um you're you're you've always been an inspiration ever since the first time I've met you. And you know, I I I love everything you're about, man. Um well I certainly appreciate that and appreciate the time to talk to you. It's when great. you start your fan club, I'll be the president of it. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> be well, my friend. Okay. Stay you too. Up. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, ad yakers. 
Hope you enjoyed it. Because we have many more great conversations planned and guests lined up ready to yak it up. Ad Yak is sponsored and produced by ASR Media. Theme song was written and performed by Dan Ross. Ad Yak is the official podcast of the AAF Greater Lehigh Valley Ad Club. Stay hungry, stay humble. Till next time. This episode of Ad Yak is rated O for, oh man, that was good. <laughs>